So I first met Tom in 1992, not in the 60s, like some of the other speakers. And I was a graduate student at the time at Berkeley. And I managed to finagle an invitation to give an ISL seminar, which is a big deal for a graduate student. And a boss was my host. Um, and I managed to lose my voice that day, which made me even more nervous to meet the famous Tom Cover in a one-on-one -on -one meeting that we had before my talk. Of course, Tom was gracious and welcoming, as was his way. And that was the first time that I met him, and I was struck immediately by his amazing intellect and his ability to distill ideas down to their core essence, but also by his humble demeanor and his wry sense of humor, which I experienced uh, as we were deep in discussion about research. At some point, I apologized for my voice being so faint and raspy, to which he responded without missing a beat, I think it sounds rather sexy. <laughs> Well, maybe that wouldn't go down as a politically correct response, but it definitely put both of us, uh, well, made us both laugh and put me at ease for, for the rest of the discussion. Then a few years later in 99, I had the, the amazing good fortune to join Stanford and become colleagues with Tom. Uh, we were still in the Duran building then, and Tom was always available to talk to his junior colleague and anybody about research, typically on his first floor balcony, while he enjoyed, and I mean really enjoyed, a cigarette. I can't believe no one's mentioned cigarettes. I think the only thing he was as passionate about as information theory was, was smoking. Um, it was through these many discussions that I came to know and appreciate Tom's legendary creativity and brilliance. Really, nobody thought about research the way that Tom did or explained it the way that Tom did. I recall a talk that he gave once about dirty paper coding, which he described as Martians stomping out a message on a, junior, a jagged lunar landscape. And by thinking in such an abstract and, and really fun manner, Tom not only cracked some of the most challenging problems in information theory, but he did so with solutions that were steeped in elegance and beauty and simplicity. And I think that's also what made him such a great teacher, not just to his students, but to all of us. Um, he was also amazingly humble and open. And uh, that served as an inspiration to me and will always throughout my career. And I didn't really know how humble he was until the day after he died when I went to visit his family. And I was talking to his brothers and his son, Bill, and his stepson, Gordon. And it became apparent to me that they really didn't know how much of a giant Tom was in his field, the prestige of the awards that he had won, and, and how highly esteemed he was to all of us. And, and I hope that through this memorial and the one we're having at Stanford in October that we can convey some of this to Tom's family and especially to his grandchildren that will never really know him, including his twin granddaughters that were born just a few weeks ago. I was fortunate to have Tom involved in almost every um, multi-PI program that I, uh, that I worked on at Stanford. And having Tom be part of these endeavors not only raised the level of ideas and creativity and impact, but of course the prestige of the PI team. And, and Tom, unlike you know many senior faculty members, none in this room of course, he was a very active PI. He would come to every meeting, sometimes taking red-eye flights so that he could show up. He would give ideas, share his ideas, give talks, and, um, and he always had suggestions that were so Tom-like. We had a discussion a few weeks before he died about the uh, uh, school, student school that we were hosting at Stanford as part of the NSF Science uh, of Information, and Tom's idea was to have uh, faculty talk for only five minutes each, unlike, uh, you know, many faculty like to go on a lot longer than that. So he said, no, let's have five minute talks and then leave everything else open to discussion. And I think that's how he approached research and working with students. So I will very much miss having Tom as a colleague and a co-PI, but so much more so as a friend. Uh, I have wonderful memories of dinners we had together, often with Karen in San Francisco and Chicago and in my home. And Perhaps one of my favorite memories of Tom is from a year ago at my birthday party. Uh, we had set up a large bouncy house for the kids, and Tom, being a big kid at heart, uh, went inside to bounce. 
And I quickly joined him. I have pictures uh, to prove it. And I'm not really sure there's many famous information theorists of any age, let alone in their 70s, who would go into a kid's bouncy house, let alone enjoy it as much as Tom did. So in many ways, Tom was a very private person. Few of us knew that he had a debilitating liver disease until two weeks before his death when he was raced to the hospital uh, due to complications, which we found out later he'd struggled with for many years. Of course, we were very worried about him. And while the news was at first optimistic, as the days wore on, his chances for recovery appeared more mixed. Tom was not seeing visitors except family until a week later, and that coincided with the Big Ideas workshop of the NSF Center, which Tom was supposed to attend. And somehow, despite what was going on, he managed to convey that he wouldn't be able to make it. Um, so many, or some of us here, were there. and. Um, when I got back to Stanford uh, on that Monday, I went to the, I called the hospital to see if I could visit Tom, and I heard he'd, he'd been moved out of the hospital, which I thought was a good sign. So I called Karen and expected Tom to be home, and she told me he was in a recuperation facility and that it would be good for me to go see him because I spoke his language. So um, when I got to his room, his best friend Mike Davis was there keeping watch over him, and Tom's graduate students had been there earlier that day. He, uh, he seemed uncomfortable and, and not very coherent, but I knew he would understand on some level our conversation, so I told him how much we missed him at the workshop and a uh, little bit about the big ideas and how much he would have contributed to them. Uh, Karen came by a bit later, and, and then Mike left, so Karen and I would talk to Tom and to each other trying to find some optimism and humor in a bleak situation. In fact, at some point, we told Tom that we would dance if he would pay attention. <laughs> um, we had some hope that might perk him up, but, uh, but it wasn't to be. I suggested Karen get herself some lunch since she had a long day ahead, and then it was just me and Tom. And I talked to him a little bit, but mostly I was just there. And as the afternoon wore on, my optimism faded. The only coherent thing Tom said was Karen's name, and I told him she'd be right back for him. And then she came back, and it was time for me to go, but I had to say goodbye. And uh, of course, there's no right words to say to someone who's dying, so I just gave Tom a kiss on the cheek, and I told him that we all loved and cared about him very much, and he died a few hours later. So I very much hope that through my words and the eloquent words of many people here spoken at his 70th birthday party a few years back, that the love and friendship and caring that we all had for Tom were with him during those last hours of his life.